Thank you all for coming on a Friday afternoon. I'm really happy to introduce my old buddy, Barry Wasserman. I first moved in there when I was a young university fan or a young professor. Barry was a student. Barry was a student. Um, and I can sort of take credit as this is kind of my first student, but really, I didn't really advise him. I was a co advisor. And actually, in fact, no one advised Barry. Give it whatever you wanted. Um, which, which is a very nice thesis. And then he graduated from the next Carnegie Mellon University for his entire career. Um, a very celebrated career, of course, medal winner in National Academy of Sciences, two well-known books and scores of really important research papers. Um, and it's taken me 20 years to get there to visit you. And he also doesn't like to travel, so um, hopefully we can help you another 20 years. Um, and Larry, Trent Larry is a, a very broad statistician. He's, he's, he's a renaissance man. So many of us now are very narrow in our fields. It's focused on one thing for one time. Larry, but he's rare and he knows a lot about a lot of different things. So it's a really wonderful person to talk to you about. He's also one of the funniest people in statistics. So very happy to have you here. Thank you, Rob. That I don't know if I can live up to that uh, introduction. That was a very kind introduction, and uh, especially the being funny part during the <laughs> talk. I'll I'll do my best. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is sort of a, this is, I've extracted some things from a whole series of papers. The, the, the unifying thing is trying to do uh, inference with as few assumptions as possible, model-free inference. Let me say at the outset, I'm not against models. I think models are a really important part of statistics. But there are certain times when you want to ask, how much can we actually do without using models? And so the question here is, we're trying to ask is, what kind of inferential things can we do that are valid, that have validity, and that don't assume models? Um, or very weak models is probably more, more accurate. Um, I, I, since I have pulled things from many different uh, papers, I just want to acknowledge various co-authors. So Yotam and Nick are, are students uh, at CMU. Jing, Max, and Alessandro are colleagues at CMU. Jamie Robbins is at Harvard. Mauricio is a former student. Ryan, you all know, uh, is my colleague, Rob's son, and Jayalk and Robin are other two, two more students. So the outline of the talk, well, I, first I, wanted, I thought if you're going to talk about trying to get away from models, you need to put in a good quote. And there's the standard quote everybody says, all models are wrong, some are useful. But I like this one better, but I've actually had trouble figuring out where it comes from. So I saw somebody else use this quote, use models but don't believe them. And I've tried to trace the history of this quote, and it's surprisingly difficult. Uh, as far as I can tell, the best guess is Tukey. And, but my favorite, since I'm putting up quotes, my favorite one, just for its, how literate it is, is from David Friedman. And this is a very David Friedman-ish talk, because David Friedman, if you didn't know him, sort of didn't, was very skeptical of statistical models. And he says, investigators who use regression, not paying attention to the connection, to the phenomena they're studying. By the time the models are deployed, the scientific position is hopeless. Reliance on models in such cases is Panglossian. And when I saw that, I went, what the hell is Panglossian? <laughs> so I had to look it up. <laughs> I had to look it up in the dictionary, and it, it's sort of like a fantasy kind of a thing. So anyway, we're going to just focus on predictive quantities. Like thing, We're not going to really focus so much on parameters in the usual sense, but rather predictive quantities. And we're going to try, we'll be talking about models, often linear models, in terms of the fitting, but not the assumptions. But what we want to get away from is we want to see how much can we say if we don't assume linearity or constant variance or incoherence or sparsity or anything like that. The answer I'm going to tell you is quite limited. You can't say a lot, and you can't prove a lot, as it turns out. But you can say some things, and so that's what I want to tell you about. Um, the heart of the talk is... Uh, to, to, oh, thank you. The heart of the talk, so most of the talk will be part one, and that's going to be in two parts. The first thing is in uh, a small thing about leaving out covariates. But then the heart of the talk that I'll get to is something called conformalization. And I'll explain what that is. It's something invented in the computer science literature. And most of what the talk is about is taking this idea from the computer science literature, this conformalization. I'll explain what it is and then figuring out its statistical properties and can you say if it's optimal and things like that. If I have time, and I doubt I will, I'll just mention how you can use this kind of predictive conformalization in other problems such as random effects and clustering. In particular, I mention random effects because it's everything I'm doing does have a big assumption in it despite the fact that it says model-free. 
The truth is I'm assuming IID, which is a big assumption. And random effects is our first attempt to get away from the IID assumption, um, although I probably, wanna, I probably won't get to it. So here's the setup. Please. Um, the setup is the usual one. So I have n pairs of data, x1, y1, xn, yn, from some unknown distribution p. And the covariate x will have dimension d, and we're going to, of course, be interested in the case where d is big. d is possibly larger than n. And y, for the most of the talk, will be real valued, but I'm going to do some classification as well, so it'll, it'll be uh, discrete in some cases. So again, the, the, the hope is to make, other than iid, no assumptions at all. And to eke out whatever we can. If we start with linear regression, as, as uh, you all know, we can do linear regression without assuming a linear model, as long as we interpret the beta to be just the best linear predictor, the projection onto the space spanned by x. So that's how we're going to think about beta here. Beta is no longer a true, not like y equals x beta plus epsilon. It's just the best linear predictor. And we're, I should say we're treating the x's as random. And it's important to just keep in mind that um, the, the parameter then we're estimating is really a statistical functional. In a sense, we're really in a semi-parametric situation. Be and this functional beta star, this best linear fit, you should think of as some nonlinear function of you know, all the covariances and things like that. And it's really the, the lack of linearity, the fact that it's nonlinear, causes some problems. If we did want to infer this in a distribution-free way, the, the natural thing you would do is either do the bootstrap or normal approximation along with least squares. So I'm thinking here of d as being increasing with n but still being less than n. But that, you're probably familiar with the fact that if you try to do inference using the CLT or the bootstrap in linear regression, I don't know if you are or not familiar with this, it doesn't work very well when d is increasing and when the model is incorrect. So what I'm going to look at first is just to, for some background, is to say how close is root n beta hat minus beta to it, say it's bootstrap distribution or it's normal approximation when d is of the same order as n. And unfortunately, it's, it's not very good. We tried to find a reference for this, and honestly, uh, in, with all of these conditions, the model's wrong, that d is increasing with n, and, and x is random. We couldn't find a precise statement about this. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'll tell you what we did, which was to work out how close it is to the normal approximation. First, let me just show you a, an example. So this is an example with n is 100, d is 50. So d is less than n, but pretty large. And I'm just showing you here beta 1 hat minus beta 1 times root n. So just the standardized coefficient. This is the true sampling distribution. And I'm just showing you here three typical bootstrap samples. And not surprisingly, if you're familiar with this, it's quite poor. And this is, this is the point that I'm talking about. What we, in this paper I'm referring to here, which I can send you if you like, uh, we just tried to make this precise by, by computing how far is this actual sampling distribution from the normal. And the, it's a bit discouraging, so I'm going to tell you the answer. I've thrown away a, a million constants that are not very interesting, that were painful to keep track of. The, oh, this is actually a typo. This should say, because beta hat is a vector, so this is the probability that beta hat minus beta root n is in a rectangle, and I'm taking the supremum over all rectangles. And I'm comparing that to the normal approximation. When I say the normal approximation, I mean the normal approximation with the estimated covariance matrix the sandwich estimator, as it's called. So the thing you would actually use to construct confidence intervals. And what we find is, you know, keep in mind that this beta is actually a nonlinear parameter, as we saw. And um, you just do a bunch of expansions. And what you find out is there's th the distance between uh, the, the sampling distribution and its normal approximation or its bootstrap approximation actually is driven by three different terms. One of them corresponds to, if you think of if you think of Taylor expanding that nonlinear function, there'll be a linear component which contributes d squared. And that's sort of a familiar rate for high dimensional uh, asymptotics. Unfortunately, the nonlinear terms contribute much more, d to the fourth over n. The more surprising one is that because we're estimating the covariance matrix, or equivalently doing the bootstrap, there's this extra term that seems to come up. And it's very bad, d to the fifth uh, over n. And that's just sort of confirming what we saw in the, in the simulation. So the worst term is this d to the fifth over n to the one sixth. The one sixth comes about for certain technical reasons that you can't 
improve on the one sixth. Um, there's an old paper by the probabilist Benkis who points out that the end of the one sixth is actually optimal. But the d to the fifth is the real problem. And again, it's due to estimating the covariance of beta hat for which you need to do to do inferences. So to make, if you wanted to use the normal approximation, d has to be little o to the end of the one fifth, which is for all practical purposes a constant, right? So this is telling us you need some other way to do, to do this. So uh, a similar bound holds for the bootstrap, and so it's bad, and again, you can confirm this by simulation. You might ask, though, I said that the distance between the distribution and the normal is upper bounded by that quantity, but is that bound tight? So I don't know. Uh, th we think it is, but that's just intuition. We proved this by doing a, a large Bariacine bound, and lower bounds for Bari Bariacine theorems, just to remind the students, you know, are like how far you are from the normal. And the, unfortunately, lower bounds in Bariacine theorems are very rare. Uh, I only found two papers actually that do lower bounds. So we don't know how to prove that the bound we have is tight, but it seems to confirm what we see in simulations, which is that the simplest approach you might take doesn't work. So what is this telling us? This is just telling us why are we inferring beta when we're not even assuming the linear model is correct? That's, that's the way I'm interpreting this, is why don't we just do something else? And by the way, oh, I should mention at the same time there was a paper by Al Karui and Perdom that uses uh, random matrix theory to analyze uh, the bootstrap in this situation, and they come to the same conclusion. So what are the two solutions? Well, the first one, maybe I used to like, and now I'm not so hot on, but I'll, I'll just go through it quickly, which is just leaving out covariates and seeing how much things change. It's, it's, it's notable for being very simple, but there are interpretation problems with it. Um, but I wanna, I'll just mention it quickly so I can, you can see what I'm doing there. But the more interesting one, and the one I wanna focus on for most of the talk, is this mystical word I keep mentioning, conformalization, um, which I'll explain to you because my experience is uh, most people haven't seen it before. It's this very, very simple idea, and it, but it's surprisingly powerful, and as you'll see, it's extremely accurate. It's very hard to break it. So I'll let me get the first thing out of the way, which is just when we were thinking about, well, just going back in time, when we were thinking about how are we going to do inferences without making assumptions, the obvious and simplest thing that seemed to us would just drop covariates and see what happens instead of looking at beta. So we're going to just redefine the parameter very simply. Unfortunately, it has this step that uh, I've talked about in this step a lot with Rob, uh, and now he's, uh, he's complained about it, and, but now I, I used to, now I'm, I'm sort of agreeing with him, I think, that this sort of bothers me too, that it makes things really, really easy, but it makes them very hard to interpret. So it's, it's, the idea is ex extremely simple. You just split the data, fit the model on the first half, and, and say, and this doesn't even have to be linear regression now. We could be doing cart, or we could be doing a random forest, or a non-parametric fit. Then you just drop variable j to see how important it is, and rerun the fit, m hat minus j. And now what we look at is we use the second half of the data, and we look at just the, how, what is the change in accuracy. So this is y minus new model, minus y minus the first model. This is just how much accuracy have we lost by dropping variable j. We look at the law of this quantity, and, s and then we estimate, say, the mean or the median of that. Okay? So it's just the mean change in accuracy when, the, uh, when you drop variable j. It seems very simple and interpretable, although there is a problem I'll talk about. Um, so what you do is once you fit the model, this is very important. This is conditional on the first half, and so I'm keeping m hat fixed. And now you just take the residuals from D2 and you compute them and it's really easy, right? You just, you, you know how to get an exact confidence interval for the median, so you get exact inference for the median, or if you prefer, just do a confidence interval for the mean. But you have to keep in mind that this is being conditioned on and this is fixed. In fact, I think the way John would say it, if, uh, he had a good way of saying it, this is an inference not about the estimator, but about this estimate. This is saying if I use this particular estimate in the future to do predictions, how much am I losing by dropping variable j? And again, m hat can be anything. And so again, the, if you do the median, there's an exact confidence interval. There's no asymptotic error. If you do the mean, then you know, you, you, we're down to a one-dimensional quantity, so that we don't have any cursive dimensionality anymore. We don't have to worry about the accuracy of the, of the uh, normal approximation. Uh, and I've, I'm not claiming, by the way, we've invented this, right? Sim there's very lots of similar ideas out there. If you're familiar with 
Leo Bryman's permutation importance in Brandon Fort's very similar flavor. Um, this exact thing was used by Mench and Hooker in their paper about random forests. Bin Yu pointed out to me that she has a paper that does exactly the same thing for, for neural nets. They call it CAR, which is uh, something adjusted something. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Very informative. <laughs> I, I, that's my memory going on me. Uh, and Laurie Davies has some recent papers where instead of dropping a variable, he just throws in random noise and so on. I mean, these ideas are, have been around for a long time, obviously. Um, but I want to emphasize that th the real problem, so there's two problems. One is the data splitting bothers people because it, it could be inefficient, but also because you could get different answers if you split the data again. But the biggest problem is the interpretation because I want to emphasize again that this is a conditional quantity. It's tempting to think of this as a population target that I'm estimating, but it's not really. The marginal the corresponding marginal population target, what would that be? That would be something like this. This is just now functional of the distribution. This is just the expected uh, difference between y minus m without j and, and with j. Or maybe if you prefer, you're more, we're more used to doing this on the squared scale. That's starting to look like r squared. The nice thing about putting it this way is this is a definite population functional, and it's just the non parametric r squared if you divide through by the, by the variance. The, the only reason why we're sort of avoiding it is because we're trying to play this game of not putting in any modeling assumptions. This is now a semi-parametric problem. I'm trying to estimate a one-dimensional functional in an, with an infinite dimensional nuisance parameter, and it's just not possible, at least uh, in these weak assumption uh, world that we're in, to true come up with a, a good estimate of that quantity. If you just compute it the way I did it, splitting the data, and plugging it in. That's a plug-in estimator. Um, so as an estimate of psi, it's a plug-in estimator. The problem is it's biased. This is always true. If you have a high dimensional situation, you have a, a one-dimensional parameter of interest, not always, but if you just put in a plug-in estimator, often the estimator is biased. That's the, that's the main problem you find in semi-parametric infants. So you might try, why, don't, why not, instead of using like least squares or something like that, why don't we take some estimate m hat, which is very low bias to start with? That's exactly, as by coincidence, a paper appeared uh, this year by Luc DeVroy and his colleagues, which does exactly this. They don't call it loco, obviously, but this is what they're doing. They're doing loco, and they're, they're assessing variable importance this way, but they're using one nearest neighbors. And why are they using one nearest neighbors? Because one nearest neighbors is a high variance, low bias estimator, and the, I, I guess at least they don't say this explicitly in the paper, but I think the hope is that this would be a less biased target. They talk quite a bit about the bias, actually. But as you might expect, I, we, so we tried this, but as you might expect, one nearest neighbor is not going to be a very powerful method, and the power is so low that this is not usable. Um, if you're familiar with semi-parametric inference, you might say, well, there's a, there's a standard way in semi-parametric inference to fix bias. You take that target, you compute its first order influence function, and you subtract it off. And then you have, hopefully, a, a lower bias estimate. And indeed, in 2017, a paper appeared by uh, these guys, which does exactly that. They take that target that function, they compute the influence function, they subtract it off, and that's their target of inference. Um, the problem is you still need very, very strong assumptions to argue that what you're getting out is a valid interval. But more importantly, uh, there's a bit of a disaster that happens, which is under the null hypothesis that variable j doesn't matter, the, this, the influence function becomes degenerate. And that's in a, you can't have a degenerate influence function and get valid confidence intervals. And in fact, they even report in the paper that near the null hypothesis, the interval undercovers. So this is actually a very serious problem. Uh, I'm not sure how to fix it. Uh, I should say that <laughs> I just mentioned here that I was, I've, I've started to work with my colleague, Jamie Robbins, who is convinced we can fix this problem by using higher order influence functions, but we, we don't have results to report yet. So it might be fixable, but I'm not sure. So ultimately, if you are going to use that, you have to live with the fact that it's a statement about how important is variable j for my estimator, for my estimate m hat in future data. It's not a statement about the whole data generating process. Let me just, so that, to be honest, that's now become, uh, thrown some water on that for me and I'm less excited about that. 
Um, but just before I move on then to the better idea, which is the con conformal idea, let me just show you some simulations so you see that it, it does sort of work. Um, the RT means I stole the slide from Ryan Tibshirani. I just want to give him credit. He had such a nice couple slides about the simulations, and he did the simulations. Um, so this is just, uh, the, the model actually is linear, and it's high dimensional, uh, 500 dimensions, n equals to 200. Beta is very sparse, it's the first five are non-zero. And now we compute this thing. We're computing exact median intervals for this loco thing, as we call it. And it's been Bonferroni corrected, so it, 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 it's accounting for, um, uh, for the multiple testing. And you get out very nice intervals, although you have to keep in mind what the interpretation is. So you can see the first five effects, it completely captures them correctly, that these are the five true effects. These are all the, this is a subsample of all the zero effects. Uh, you can do this with any method. So here we are using stepwise regression. We get a little bit less power, but the intervals are still correct for what they are. This is loco, but now the first step is a sparse additive model, which is a type of non-parametric regression. So the point I'm trying to show here is that, that this method is so simple that you can use it with an arbitrarily complicated fitting mechanism. Although it doesn't always work well, here's a random forest, and you can see it's not detecting many of the effects, but that's because this is a linear model. Question? They are, yes. I don't think so because the, the method doesn't actually require the model to be correctly specified. But I'm going to show you some simulations on the next method where we do have misspecified models. So that will maybe answer your question more clearly. Okay. So what's, you know, when we did this, we were pretty excited that it was so simple and, and it worked. But, and it does have some good features. It, any algorithm can be used. It is, it sounds expensive. You have to drop every variable, but you know, that's not such a big deal these days. And by the way, I should say that all of the code for this, everything's reproducible and Ryan's code is on GitHub. So you can, and, and he does a great job of this reproducibility. So you can, you can just run his R code and reproduce it, our examples. And the nice thing again is, as long as you're willing to interpret it correctly, there's no distributional uh, assumptions at all. And, you can use, and they're finite sample confidence intervals. And because we're Bonferroni correcting, we're safe about selecting out if we just want to look at a particular confidence interval and so on. And they're very accurate because they're one-dimensional parameters we're estimating. So uh, except for the, bon the Bonferroni correction costs you a log term, but otherwise it's th they're of length 1 over root n. And it's, it's very easy. Uh, oh, that was just one more example I wanted to show. Ryan, did really what he's trying to show is how flexible this is in the sense that the first half of the data, he's fitting the lasso, fitting a sparse out of the model, fitting a random forest, then choosing between those using cross-validation, and then doing all this, and it still works because the second half of the data is clean, right? It, has, it doesn't know about all the things that you've done on this first half of the data. Um, I was going to show you a, a simulation showing the bias that I talked about, um, but so far the only simulation we have, and this is exactly relates to the question I think you asked, is this was done under favorable conditions, so unfortunately, so what, let me show you. Let me tell you what I'm showing you. This is the lasso sparse additive model random forest, just showing you some a typical run. That's what the confidence intervals are. So you've already seen that. But what is what what is it actually targeting? Remember that it's targeting uh, an expected value conditional on the first half. That's the light green dots. And so in the principle, the, the intervals should be typically centered around those light green dots. The dark green dots are the actual marginal quantity, that psi that I define, which is the thing we'd really like to estimate. And it, it, yeah, maybe you probably can't even see it so much, but these are not exactly zero. There is some bias there, but it doesn't seem to be very biased. But this is all one simulation, so you shouldn't draw too many conclusions from it. I'm sure we could work harder and find something where you could see more bias. But at least in that case, it was much better than we expected. But splitting the data, having this kind of data-dependent uh, defined inference and parameter maybe isn't so appealing. So let me talk about this other method, 
which is a much, it's even more purely predictive. And again, it makes no assumptions. And I'll focus on regression, and if th there's time, I'll show you again how it can be used in other tasks besides regression, but uh, it's mainly for regression. So let me just, I want to just situate, what because I'm about to pull things from a bunch of papers, so I want to give you the big picture. The basic idea is not ours. It's due to Vladimir Volk and Gamera and Schaefer, all the way back in 2005, and it's called conformal prediction. I'll define what it means in a minute. It's, it, and you'll see it's very simple. Um, so I've devoted, in the last few years, I've devoted a lot of, so the, the way it's written in Volk's work, it's a little bit hard to understand it because it's, first of all, he does, it's all sequential, and it's written in a kind of computer science sort of language or something. So what I've been doing for the last few years is translating this sort of into statistics and then asking, does it have optimal statistical properties? Um, so we, I'll tell you a little bit about what we did for density estimation and, and regression. The, the, let me just give you the quick summary. If you take something which you believe is minimax under certain conditions and you run it through this algorithm I'm about to describe, it preserves the minimaxity. This is the underlying message. You lose nothing by doing this conformalization. Um, and, but mostly what I'm going to focus on is this recent paper of ours that appeared in JAZA about applying this to high dimensional regression. And I'll tell you what little, there's a little bit we can say theoretically about it, not a lot, but I'll tell you the theoretical properties. And then I'm just going to show you how well it works by simulation. It works remarkably well. If I have time, I'll tell you a little bit about multi-class problems and in particular, oh, I forgot to mention, so the multi-class problems, I'm actually going to slip in a little bit of deep learning. Uh, everybody's got to have deep learning in their talks now. <coughs> and so um, I did it the only way I knew how, which is to have a student who knows how to do it, because I have no idea how to do it. But, but you'll see that it actually, I'm not a pro uh, proponent necessarily of deep learning, but what I'll show you is that it actually is a nice add-on to deep learning, and for reasons you'll see uh, soon. Oh, there's the deep learning, okay. So let's just go, go. So, so let me, in one slide, I can explain the whole conformal idea. That it's really simple. What we're going to do is we're gonna take a data set, we're gonna augment it, we're gonna add a new data point. So it's the opposite of cross-validation. Instead of dropping one, you add one. Then you do a hypothesis test. You're testing, did the point I add in, that I just added in, does it actually belong there? Is that a correct point? And then you just invert the test. That's the, so let me walk through the steps. Um, suppose you've observed x1, y1, up to xn, yn. Actually, let's pretend the x is observed too. So we've got a new x, little x is a new x, and we're looking at the y. We don't know what y is, so for the moment, put in an arbitrary value y. So little y is arbitrary. Think of this as a tentative guess at what the new y is. This forms the augmented data set. Now you get what they call conformal score. That's why it's called conformal prediction, but it's just a residual in our language. So there'll be some, mo like you should think of here a, as a as something you're computing from the data, like a model fit, and then this is just the ith observation. So this is nothing other than, think of it as the ith residual. But remember that the fit is being done on A, the augmented data. That's critical to make the whole thing work. And if you think about it, you've now got, instead of n residuals, you have n plus one residuals, because you have the n data points plus your guess. And the data are exchangeable, because we're assuming IID. The residuals are exchangeable. And in particular, suppose the null hypothesis is true. Forget the x, actually. Suppose the null hypothesis is true that I happen to have thrown in the correct value of y. I just happen to have done that. Then these are n plus 1 exchangeable observations. The residuals are exchangeable. And in particular, the last residual corresponding to your guess has an equal chance. John. Okay, I think you're not saying that if xn plus 1 should be drawn from the same distance. Yes. The not fixed x. Thank you. X, the, the, that little x, which should be an x n plus 1, and it should be a capital X n plus 1 random, as John said, and drawn from the same distribution. Thanks. Um, because there is, this thing's going to be over the randomness of the whole sample. So every residual has the same probability of having any position that the, the ranks are uniform. So the number of, the, the fraction of residuals bigger than your guess is therefore uniform. This is actually a p-value, an exact p-value. So you now have a p-value, so you basically put in a guess and you said, okay, 
is the guess correct? Well, you've done a test, and the test is an exact test with an exact p-value. Now you just do the next step, you invert it, right? You just find the set of all y's such that the p-value is bigger than alpha. And you automatically now have a, a confidence interval or better, a prediction interval over all of the randomness. I, I want to emphasize that. So what you get, and yeah, just to John's point, this p is over everything. It's over all the randomness. So the probability overall that yn plus 1 is contained in this set is at least 1 minus alpha, and that's true for all distributions. Even though you might have used a model to fit the, mo to, you used a model to compute a residual, there's nothing here that depends on that model being correct. And by the way, it's, there's an upper bound too, so it's not just bigger than 1 minus alpha, it's very close to, to 1 minus alpha. So it's kind of, I mean, it's a very simple idea. And it, it might remind you if you've ever, uh, you know, you think of the order statistics and it's e you're equally likely to get a new observation in between all the order statistics is basically the same kind of idea. And again, just to, uh, keep saying no assumptions. Okay, um, let me just say now, I, I was really happy, one thing that's nice about this, and I'll show you it, it, how we actually use it in a minute, but there is a computational cost here, right? Because just going back, I have to do this for every possible y put it in and rerun the algorithm. So if you want to avoid that calculation, Ryan's code does that, but if you, there is a way to speed up the calculation, and it's again using data splitting, but I want to emphasize that this use of data splitting is completely different than the use before. Before, it was to solve an inference problem. Here, I'm splitting the data just for purely for computational reasons, and it's completely optional. It's not necessary. But it just speeds things up. It, it allows you to not have to do the augmentation step. You basically just fit something, let's call it Q, on the first half of the data, you compute the residual from the second half of the data, and then it, it, it can't get any simpler. You just simply um, compute those residuals on the second half of the data, you get the one minus alpha quantile of those residuals, and then that defines your prediction set. The set of Y's that are less than that uh, quantile has the right coverage. It can be dangerous to blur the distinction between a confidence interval and a prediction interval because a prediction interval has in it the randomness that's associated with that's an true. observation, whereas a confidence interval doesn't. And so the, the basis for the computations is different in both cases. It doesn't have to be so different, but it, in typical cases it is. That's a good point. So this is most definitely not a, if I said confidence interval, I slipped. It is really a prediction interval, a pure prediction interval. Yeah, and right. that's good. Yeah, I just want to be clear about that, yeah. Um, so with the splitting, you get the same guarantee except for a two instead of a one. Um, and the in so, so what you might think is we have this way to speed it up. You just split the data, fit a model, compute residuals, right? Uh, but the splitting might bother you. Because after all, if you'd split it again, you get a different answer. So why not do multiple splits and combine them? And you can do that. In this case, it's perfectly valid. Oops, that's a typo. Union should be intersection. You split it n times, capital N times. You compute each one at level alpha over n for a Bonferroni correction. But then you get to take the intersection. So there's two opposing forces here. The Bonferroni correction makes the intervals wider. But then you're intersecting them, which hopefully makes them a bit smaller again. And the interesting question is, is there a sweet spot? Is there a number of times to do the splitting, which minimizes the size of the set? And, and it turns out, no. Well, it turns out, yes, the answer is one. Um, <laughs> it just turns out this way, that under pretty weak conditions, we can show that the Lebesgue measure of splitting n times is always bigger than the Lebesgue measure of a single split. It just turns out to be that way. And then we see this numerically, that we never see any advantage to combining over several splits, which was kind of disappointing because I thought that was a good thing to do. But So everything you're going to see is based on a single split or based on the full conformal algorithm. Now you might wonder which residual do you, I mean I said you could put, you could put in any residual you want, any conformity score as they call it. And uh, I'll just give you, so any, anything is valid. So the choice of the residual doesn't affect the validity of the interval, it affects the efficiency. It affects how long the interval is. And I'll get to the oracle properties in a moment. But let me just give you examples of what, what are some of the conformity scores you might use. Well, you might use the usual residual, y, i minus m hat. Just keep in mind I put the aug to remind you that m hat is some regression function computed from the data and the augmentation. 
But it turns out, in some cases, the optimal thing to do in a certain sense, I'll explain in a minute, is one over a density estimator. Um, there are some cases you'll see it, it's optimal to actually use the density of y given x. And one thing we've discovered recently, which is to do with deep learning actually, is there's some advantages sometimes to using x given y. And the reason is because if you see, and I'll show you examples of this, if you see a new image that you've never seen before, then this will typically be small for all the classes, and so this will typically be big. But I'll show you an example of that. You can even stick in a parametric model if you prefer, because th don't forget, the parametric model is just a way to compute these conformity scores. The correctness of the model, again, will not affect the validity of the intervals. So let me say a word about the efficiency. So th what I like about this is, you know, look, you still have to eventually fit a model, and you have to make some decisions about how you're going to fit the model, and that is going to affect the efficiency, but at least it separates efficiency from validity. I think separating them into sort of two separate tasks is kind of nice. So we're guaranteed that even if I choose a bad model or a bad residual, maybe I'll get bigger intervals, but it won't affect you know, how your coverage probabilities. So uh, let me s just give you some examples of that. You can actually, if you say, I like using models and I want to make certain assumptions and get minimax estimators, let me just show you a few examples of how you can, how that blends perfectly in with the whole conformal algorithm. So this is uh, from one, our first paper on this. Suppose you're doing what I'll call unsupervised prediction, by which I mean you observe y1 up to yn, and then you just have to predict the next guy. Very simple. It turns out that if you use as your score a kernel density estimator, one over that, I, I just use one over that so that small and bigger in the right direction, um, like an unlikely observation is a big residual. Just keep in mind that it's been augmented, and that's going to be the score. Um, what happens? Well, the resulting thing, of course, has the validity. But now you can, now you can add the assumptions. See, we're not, I'm not saying we shouldn't add in uh, assumptions, but we put them in after the construction. So now you say, let's suppose the usual assumptions we make, like P is set in a holder ball, and maybe this is a regularity condition that's often assumed on the level sets of the density function. What happens to the conformal interval? And what happens is this. There is an oracle interval. These are the only kind of optimality statements we can typically make. So there's an oracle interval, which is just the smallest interval with probability 1 minus alpha. And you can say that the Lebesgue measure of the difference between the conformal interval and the oracle is less than this quantity. And this is, happens to be the minimax rate for this problem. The point here is that you've lost nothing by using this conformal inference. You get an interval length, which is minimax optimal, and so you inherit the minimaxity of whatever procedure you're using. But again, if these assumptions don't hold, maybe, it, maybe a density doesn't even exist, you still get the, at least you still get the validity. Okay. L let me say a little bit of, about what we can say in the regression case, and again, it's sort of limited what we can say because we're making so few assumptions. Um, but let's say we're using the residuals, yi minus m hat, and we compute this interval. Let's again compare the conformal interval to an oracle. So there's actually two oracles you can consider. Oracle number one says, take the estimated regression function, which somehow migrated from m hat to mu hat, sorry about that, plus or minus the quantile of the law of y minus mu hat. It's an oracle because we don't know that, but that, that, that's in some sense uh, would be a very good interval if you knew that quantile. And there's even a stronger oracle, which we call the super oracle, which would assume even more, assume you knew the true function, mu of x, and, and just basically center, you know, find the true interval around the true function mu of x using the law of y minus mu. So you'd need a lot of information, obviously, to compute that. So how does the conformal interval compare to this? And here's a we have a few results about this, I'll just report one of them, that, and it's kind of not surprising, which is it all depends sort of on the stability of the uh, estimator. So the length of the conformal interval minus the length of the oracle, this is like the excess risk, is of order these two quantities, and this is just measuring the stability. This is just saying if I, when I augment mu hat by one observation, how much can it change? And we want to say it changes by less than eta, except with probability rho. So these two numbers measure the stability of the algorithm. So that's a kind of very generic statement. Because what is this eta and what is this rho? 
So th this is the general statement, is that if you can bound the probability of how, how much the estimator can wiggle around, then we can say you're that close to the oracle. What are these numbers, rho and eta? And now, again, we, this is where we have to go and put assumptions in. So the assum I guess you could say the assumptions go in for the theory as opposed to the method. Because it's when doing the theory, oh, I, ha I was going to tell you what rho and uh, eta are, but w one more statement. If you make additional assumptions, namely that the error term epsilon is independent of x and has a, a unimodal distribution, you can also say that it's close to the and this should have been the uh, super oracle. And you also get a more traditional coverage statement in this case, th these additional assumptions, namely that, and this is the kind of statement you're probably more familiar with, like in a regression course, the probability that y is in this set, given x equals to x converges asymptotically to 1 minus alpha. But of course you do need extra assumptions for this. So just to give you an idea of it's not surprising what these terms look like if you're familiar with you know, high-dimensional asymptotics. So, so for example, if we now say, now for studying the theory, I'm going to make these extra assumptions, linearity, incoherence, and so on, then the eta, this perturbation thing, is it's not surprising. It, it depends on the sparsity, s, this is the number of non-zero betas, and the smallest eigenvalue in the restricted isometry condition, if you're familiar with that. Um, so this sort of links this whole distribution-free conformal world to the more familiar world where we do high-dimensional regression and we make various assumptions like th the usual uh, assumptions. And it just comes up, though, in our world, not in statements about the correctness of the interval, but rather in statements about the efficiency, how well it compares to the oracle. I hope that was clear. Um, let me show you some numerical examples. So this is, this is really... I mean, the, theoretically, we know the coverage has to be, uh, we're going to do 90% intervals. We know the coverage has to be 90%. Theory tells us that. But even still, you kind of you know, cross your fingers because you don't know what's going to happen when you do simulations. But it turns out to be remarkably accurate. So let me explain what the simulation is showing you. And the first example is a, is a favorable example. So it's D is 2,000, N is 200, so it's very high dimensional. But the model is a good model in the sense it's linear and normal. And the reason, what the different colors correspond to are different methods. So we're trying lasso, elastic net, stepwise regression, sparse out of the models, random forest. And in each, for each example, what we're doing is we're creating this prediction interval and we're just asking what's the empirical coverage. And you can see, and what's along here is every one of these methods has some sort of tuning parameter. So just think of this as the tuning parameter. And look at the coverage. I mean, it, I guess it shouldn't be surprising because the theorem says it has to come out to be 90%. But, it, you know, it doesn't get any more accurate than that. It is dead on 90%. John? Just to understand, so when you say cover, you draw 200 points, then you draw a 200 in first x and y, yep. and then you look at the, that y. That's what you're covering? Correct. So, so not for fixed value? No, 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 no. This is like the true margin. This is really in the marginal sense. True. Yes. This is very important. All of this, so let me say that. That's another weakness of this, you could say. Well, it, that previous result says you can do it conditional on x if there's additional assumptions. If you don't have those assumptions, this is all marginal over x, which... Well, uh, not without those extra assumptions. Yeah. Um, anyway, you can see the coverage couldn't be any better. This is the lengths, and of course now this is, th this is showing you exactly what the theory says, which is validity doesn't depend on the method, but the efficiency does. And in this case you can see, for example, that the sparse out of the model does quite poorly. The, all the other methods do well if, as long as they're uh, tuned correctly. And this is typically what we see. Um, let's look at a more, a less favorable guy. Um, so again, 2,000 dimensional, but now we're fitting a non, it, the true model is nonlinear and very heavy tailed. The, a the accuracy again is, you know, dead on. Marginal coverage, 90%. Um, and again, you see kind of what now quite a bit of difference between the, you know, the accuracies of the two methods. In this case, because it's nonlinear, not surprisingly, the sparse additive model, which is a non-parametric smoother, uh, beats all the other methods. And you could, of course, uh, you know, to do some sort of cross-validation between these methods and choose between them as well. What, 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 like what do you, what's the arc? How are these curves parameterized? Like signal strength? Uh, no, this, the ac like this axis? In, in the, what are you changing in the yeah, like this axis, you mean? Yeah, but presumably you're not changing it. 
not breaking the space, right? Sorry? Well, I just don't understand. Okay, I don't understand. You have like ten, five curves there. Oh, each curve is a different method and, and curve is, is a different choice of the regularization parameter. Okay. Yeah. So think of the lasso, this is lambda. But how do we plot them all in one plot? Yeah, we invented this relative optimism, but it, it, whether they're comparable or not, I guess, is arguable. Uh, There's just another one with this one is linear but heavily, heavily correlated, heteroscedastic, heavy tailed. Um, they're all huge intervals, it's worth noting. And they all do pretty much the same if you take their best case. But again, the coverage is, is perfect. Um, how are we doing that? So just to show you, about five minutes, yeah. Oh, what year, what's the irreducible? Oh, boy. I'm not sure because it's a heavy tail distribution. Yeah, we should have done this. We should have done this relative to sigma or something like that. I actually don't remember. Any guess? Any guess? Uh, 15. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. I, I don't remember. Um, let me skip this because Rob says five more minutes. So I'm just going to skip ahead. Um, yeah, I, I don't. Stopping early is good. Uh, I'm just going to go to something. Just talk about multi-class classification a bit, because I want to get. I want to just get to the deep learning slides, just because they look kind of cool. So um, start. So uh, so the way we. So this is a p paper uh, with Mauricio and Jing about multi-class classification. So now we're switching from regression to classification, but with multiple classes. Everything works exactly the same. Um, so y takes values in 1 to k, and we're going to allow k to be large, and I'll show you in a minute you, there's a precise rate at which k can increase with n. If it's far larger than that, then it, then it gets very inaccurate, not surprisingly. We can frame very precisely what problem we're solving here. We would like to find, so we would like to find a set valued predictor again, so we're not going to say that when we get an X, we're not going to say what class it's in. We're going to say it's in one of these classes. And I'll show you examples where that makes sense, like digits that you can't tell apart. We want to minimize the expected size of that set, subject to having correct coverage. And in this case, I've actually done it conditional on which class you're in. And so we want to minimize it. We call that the ambiguity. So this is a, sort of a well-defined, simple problem. What's the minimum size set that, such that it, you contain the true value, the true why 95% of the time. And it, it's the name in Pearson lemma. It's just a simple modification of the name in Pearson lemma. Tells you what the optimal region is. It's just the set of, uh, uh, that should say y, set of y such that p of y given x is bigger than some t. t we can choose either by some sort of plug-in estimator or we could do the whole conformal algorithm just using uh, p hat of y given x as a score. So we can do exactly the same thing. Um, so here's, an, there it is, uh, we're, that's, there should be a hat on the P. I don't know why so many typos. So uh, the plug-in version of this would be just do the obvious thing. Take P hat bigger than some T, where T is chosen empirically to get the right coverage. Once again, we can ask how well is it doing, and then the only thing we can do is compare it to an oracle. So we can say with probability 1 minus K delta, so that's telling you right there something about how fast k can grow with n, because this k times delta has to go to zero. What we can say is that the probability content of the prediction interval differenced with the uh, oracle is less than or equal to some epsilon to the gamma. And this epsilon and this delta are, again, problem dependent. So now we have to put the assumptions in. So if you put in, for just as examples, we've worked in the paper, we have various cases. They're not surprising. It's the rates you would expect. So if you're using k nearest neighbors and p of y sa given x satisfies a Lipschitz condition, then delta n turns out to be 1 over n. So k times 1 over n has to go to 0. And epsilon is of this familiar rate. Or if you prefer to do sparse things, then you, know, you can do sparse logistic regression with the incoherence assumptions. And uh, you get, it turns out you get, in this case, uh, is that right? I think that's right. Log dn to the one quarter. Delta depends on the sparsity of 
uh, beta, and so on. These are kind of familiar qu quantities just cropping up in a different part of the analysis. So what do you get out of this? So let me just show you some examples. So, um, you know, like if here's what our classifier did here was it said we, it can't tell. It doesn't classify this as a single class. It's a outputting potentially a set. And in this case, the set is 4 and 1, because it's saying I can't tell if those are 4s and 1s. Um, you know, this one is, it can't tell if they're 3 or 5. So the idea that it outputs a set rather than a single prediction, I think, is a feature, not a bug. It's a good thing. It's telling you something about the uncertainty. However, there is one um, weird thing, which is, remember, we, we argued that we're trying to minimize the expected size of the set. What's the best way to do that? Output the empty set. That has zero size. And in fact, what happens in a lot of cases is that you get the empty set. Now, my thinking on this has changed. I think, and I'm going to show you in the deep learning examples, the empty set is exactly what you want. That's what happens when you put in things you've never seen before. But I have to say, in this paper, we were so worried about this that we came up with a method to eliminate the uh, empty set. This is an example here where this is class one, class two, class three. These all get put into the empty set. Unfortunately, so outputting the empty set is actually a good idea if it's something you haven't seen before. Unfortunately, by using P of Y given X, if you think about it, the ones you're putting into the empty set are the ones right at the boundary. That's exactly the wrong things to be putting in the empty set. These things should be called two or three. And this is the problem with when we set up the, when we set up the optimization problem that way, this is the result of doing that. So a better thing to do, oh, so what we did, just so you know, is um, we just, I'll just show you a picture of it. We just do a greedy algorithm where we gradually grow each region until it fills in the empty set. But the right thing to do is to encourage empty sets because if k is large and x is amb ambiguous in some sense, c of x will be large, that's a feature, but also if you, so this is, the, this is where the choice of score comes in. It's, if you think about it for a few minutes, if you use p of x, p hat of x given y, and I know that sounds like a hard thing to do because you're thinking high dimensional density estimation. It doesn't require the density estimate to be accurate for this to work, as you'll see. Then that actually, every time you see something, I mean, it's pretty obvious, right? If you see something unusual, then it's going to have a low score. And so what that's going to do is encourage you to put the empty set, which is a feature, not a bug. And so this is where we, the deep learning comes in. So we did this. So how, we, how did we do this? Uh, Yotam, the student, he ran some deep learning thing. And then he just took the last layer. You know, the last layer of deep learning, instead of getting a prediction out, people sometimes just pull those off and use those as features, because that's sort of what it's doing, right? It's doing feature engineering, I guess. And he actually did this high dimensional density estimation on those features and, and did this. And I thought, this is never going to work, Yotam. It's too high dimensional. It works really well. It gives you very reasonable answers. Like, you know, here, sometimes you get a single answer, like that's uh, skiing. Um, we now never, but here's the good thing. We'd never seen a snake before and it gives you the null set. So it's kind of telling you you haven't seen that before. There are some weird ones. I don't understand this one. The dog comes out as Shetland sheepdog, uh, collie or toilet paper. <laughs> I cannot explain the the white circles. The white circles. Oh yeah, I guess, so maybe that's not uh, unreasonable. But the, the point here is that, so, and sometimes I have to tell you these sets can be large, but when you look at the images, it's sort of reasonable. So when the image is really uncertain, you get this big set of possible predictions, which is, I think, a reasonable thing. But when you get something that you haven't seen before, like a Jackson Pollock painting, and you put it in, we get the null set. The typical methods are forced to do some sort of prediction, which, by the way, are not such bad predictions. It calls this a coil, which is a pretty good guess, right? Um, but it's 91% sure that it's a coil, whereas we're saying it's the empty set. So the point here is if you choose the score correctly in, and use this in deep learning, uh, you get the null set. So again, there was no boxing examples and we get the null set. And the best thing is when you put in noise, pure noise, you get the null set. A question which I can't answer for you yet, but I'll know the answer soon, is what if you put in adversarial noise? If you're following deep learning, you know, people perturb images a little bit and they look the same to humans, but the, the algorithm goes crazy. And so I don't know the answer to that yet. I, I have to, he hasn't done it yet, so I don't know. Um, okay, so maybe I should, should I wrap up, Rob? Yeah, so I'm going to skip a lot of stuff. Uh, note to students, plan your talks better than this. Um, I'll, I'll just tell you quickly, the clustering stuff is just, we, we do k-means clustering. You create another residual from the clustering, 
and then you turn it into a prediction set. And then, whereas the within sums of squares of clustering always goes down as you increase k when k means, the size of the prediction set goes down and then goes up. You get a minimum. So it gives you a way of choosing, from a predictive point of view, how to choose k in k-means clustering. But that will be for another day. So let me just, uh, sorry about that, go to my conclusions. And thank you all, by the way, for coming on a Friday afternoon. I know it's the end of first week of classes. Um, just to summarize, so I, I've tried to give a flavor of different things, little pieces from different papers. They all have the same goal, which is to, to how far can we go in model free influence? And I'm not, I'll be really honest with you, I don't necessarily find all of this very satisfying all the time because the statements are kind of weak that you get out of it. But on the other hand, we're just trying to see how far we can push the whole completely model free way of thinking. Um, it can be applied, as, as you've seen, to many different problems. Uh, we have a paper on archive about random effects if you want to see how it works there. That, the, that I should say that came out because of a project we worked on with your stomach cancer data that uh, has a random effect in it, and so you have to do something different. Um, the, the real bottom line message here is just think of that conformal thing as an algorithm. You can take any procedure you like and run it through the conformal thing. You get out a prediction set, and if your procedure, if your model and so on, had optimality properties, they're automatically preserved by the conformal thing. You don't ever lose like the minimax properties and so on. Um, so the last question is, you know, all of this is predicated on an IID. I don't know what to do about that. Uh, Victor Turner Zhukov has a paper called Conformal Inference for Dependent Data, where he basically takes time series and does sort of what you would expect. You chunk it up, and then in instead of allow, you know, you, you, now you have chunks that are approximately independent, and you get approximate uh, coverage, so it's not surprising. But I don't know if you can do much better than that. I think we really, this, is, this technology seems very wedded to the, to the whole IID world. Uh, again, if you want code to do any of this stuff, uh, that's Ryan's uh, GitHub site. And thank you very much for your attention. In your whole definition, adding the extra term introduces extra randomness, so to speak. And engineers have been doing that for ages. Um, but, but second of all, under your null hypothesis, the point you added isn't any different from the other point. So the, the exchangeability that you use to get that average could be averaged over all kinds of things with other observations put in as the special one. Yeah, so I guess there's other ways you mean you could compute that score, for example? Yes. I would imagine that there are, too. This is just the simplest one. But yeah, there's probably other ways you could compute it as well. <laughs>